Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Just gonna give it a minute to let people get logged in and then we will get started. While you're logging in, if you want to say hi in the chat and let me know where you are tuning in from, that's always fun. Just gonna give it another minute or two. Hello, Laura is joining from Boston. Wonderful. Tina is in Seattle, Capitol Hill. Hi. Fantastic. Salem, Oregon, nice. Haven't been down that way in a while. U Village, Seattle, nice. Hi, Arthur. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are here, of course, to celebrate pierogi. Oops, I'm disappearing into my green screen a little bit. Apologies. <laughs> this beautiful new book from Zuza Zak and um, Paulina Chesnikova is also joining us as well. So very excited for a wonderful conversation between those two. Um, before we jump in, I'll just uh, give you a few brief notes. I'm Zoe Friesen. I'm the events manager here at Book Larder. Uh, Book Larder is a community cookbook store located in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we sell 100% cookbooks and food writing, and uh, we love uh, hosting author talks and classes and just really connecting with our food-loving community. Oh, hi, BB <laughs> from San Francisco. Fantastic. Okay, let's see. Uh, so we've been doing, a, as you can imagine, a lot more virtual events over the last couple of years. Um, we're delighted that we've been able to bring back some in-person events as well, but it's really been so great to do these virtual events where we can connect with authors, and oftentimes also interviewers from all over the world and of course attendees as well and can uh, yeah and can bring this to all of you wherever you may be which has been so delightful so we definitely plan to continue doing these um the, today's talk will be recorded it will be posted up on youtube within the next 48 hours or so um so if you need to jump off early you can always go catch the end or if you'd like to rewatch or send it to a friend that will be available to you and it will be the link will be emailed to you as well and let's see, I've turned the live transcript on. So if you want to see the closed captioning, you can go down to the bottom of your screen under more and you can turn that on or off. And let's see what else. Um, so Paulina and Zuza will chat and then we'll also leave time for questions. So any questions you might have, feel free, um, be sure to just throw those into the Q&A box. You can use the chat to you know, chat with each other, chat with me, I'll drop a link to the book, um, but any questions for Zuza and Paulina put in the Q&A box. And let's see, um, yes, um, you can support this talk by purchasing a copy of this fantastic book um, from the Book Larder, and I will be dropping a chat, as I mentioned, to that as well. We do have book plate signed copies. Thank you, Zuza. So we're very excited to have that. And thank you so much to everyone that has done that already. We appreciate it. And I think that's about all for me. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Zuza and Paulina. Thank you so much, you two, for being here. Oh, here I am. Thanks, <laughs> thank Zoe. you so much. Hello, thank you so Hi, much. Hi. I'm so excited to be celebrating <laughs> your book and delving a little deeper into it today. Oh, it's so lovely to meet you. And uh, yeah, it's lovely to celebrate it with you. And yeah, I'm a fan of your book as well. As you know, I made your um, Dolce de Leche cheesecake recently yeah. for my, yeah, for my beloved's birthday. So it, that went down so well. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I know I have a, a few of your recipes bookmarked, um, particularly that I told you the toasted buckwheat with the farmer's cheese. That's uh, one of our favorites at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a family favorite. Well, I wanted to start um, kind of from the beginning. Um, I was reading through your introduction the other day, and you write um, that, you know, your, your food writing career really began with this goal of proving to um, everyone that Polish food is more than pierogi, more than, more than dumplings. And now you've kind of, you know, come full circle and written a whole <laughs> book. Um, 
what compelled you to, to do this book after all? And, you know, were you, was there any part of you that was nervous that you were kind of giving in to the stereotype, you know, that yeah. Polish food begins and ends with <laughs> Um, Yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? Because, yeah, I started off, it started off with a comment that someone leveled at me at a wedding once that, you know, Polish food is just dumplings and I have no right to an opinion about food because it's, yeah, there's nothing. Mm. And, um, and I was so annoyed <laughs> that I started writing a book about Polish yeah. food. Which I actually oh, have right here. Oh, there we go. That's my first one, Polska. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the world has changed so much since I wrote Polska. I feel like in how people approach East European food in general, um, uh, I feel like if pierogi had been written a little bit sooner, perhaps, it I might have had some feeling of like, oh, nervousness or something like that. But because there's such a big gap between pierogi um, and Polska, and there was another cookbook in between, Amber and Rye, it's given it really a lot of time for, I feel like the world to kind of just be more open to Polish food. And when I started writing the proposal for pierogi, it was just, I just did it with so much joy and there's been so much joy within the whole process of writing this book that I didn't even for a moment actually stop and think you know hang on I think it was more just like isn't it funny that you know <laughs> Ironic. How, yeah. How life, yeah how life can come full circle and how you know you can be so annoyed about something and then actually it meant that a whole new world opened up for me Mm -hmm. because of that kind of disdain that people had for Polish food yeah it really opened up a whole new career for me which I love so much so you can't really be angry after a while because it's just opened up so many wonderful new things in trying to prove you know Polish and East European food is kind of more than what people thought it was but now I feel like people are kind of um accept that now it's kind of an accepted thing that there is actually a lot of interesting stuff about East European food so it's really the right time I think to celebrate the kind of most iconic Polish food and you know that's been just famous the world over you know the whole Polish diaspora you know still makes pierogi in many different right. forms right but and, and you know looking through the book I think you're still very intentional about educating your readers, not just about the dumplings, but you know the the wider history it's it it you know it's in, and also you have um, you know those beautiful essays scattered throughout the book on different um, kind of like essential Polish ingredients, and even reading the head notes is, you know, I feel like each each head note is like a little vignette to a specific time and place or. Um, you know, in the history of, of Poland or, you know, traditions that um, Polish families carry, have carried and, and still continue to. So I feel like you're still, you know, you kind of, you know, make this beautiful thread from Polska and pierogi on, on educating, you know, your readers on Polish food. Thank you so much. That's really lovely to hear, actually. And I hope that, um, yes, because I am all about, you know, using food as a doorway to a, a culture and another world. I think it's just the most pleasurable way to learn about other cultures for me. And I think a lot of people agree with that. Right. Um, so that's what I'm using. And um, I guess the way I'm doing it is by trying to immerse people so using stories to kind of immerse people in another world. So I guess educating them while also not making them feel like they're being educated, if that makes sense. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, in that traditional sense that, you know, like, oh, here's another, you know, lecture about <laughs> this. Right. I kind of want to make it really human. So I guess once you can connect on a human level, then you're learning things without feeling like you're learning because you're just interested and inspired right because it's one thing to write a recipe but then you give the back 
or in the context. And that's what really pulls people in uh, and, and welcomes them to stay and, and, and read through the book and really educate themselves. And, and you have, you know, like just, I mean, the photos are beautiful, but you also have just um, beautiful photos of, of different landscapes throughout, throughout yeah. Poland well, my, as well. Yeah. My uh, photographer was Polish actually um, for this book, this time, Ola uh, O. Smith. Uh -huh. So she had a, you know, because I was hoping to travel around Poland with her taking lots of pictures, but actually it didn't happen because of the pandemic. Um, so we just actually used her archive. Yeah, that's my hometown there. Oh, nice. uh, uh, pictures that she's just been sort of taking while traveling around Poland over the years. And, you know, she had all these pictures. So we were really lucky to kind of be able to use them. And, and, and you know, talking about and you do have this whole um you know in the beginning this whole section on on the history of pierogi can you talk a little bit about kind of where pierogi fall in the history of polish food and also kind of in the wider world of of dumplings um, yeah well? <laughs> yeah absolutely um you know it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly where um, dumplings came from you know there is uh, there are legends you know of course one of the legends is that you know dumplings originated in China and they started off as the little ear-shaped dumplings which we actually called ushka in Polish um, which means little ears um, you know some people say uh, they came with the Tatars other people say they came with Marco Polo you know uh, you know the Italians say they were the first you know the Chinese think right. they're the first but I actually have my own theory which is that women the world over once they had flour and water mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of fat would have just created dumplings in their own kitchens as a way of using up leftovers which is what they've been doing for you know centuries so there are all these legends which usually involve men of course but I really personally I just think you know if you were a woman in whatever ages and you had those ingredients right you would just invent dumplings and I of think course historically it's it's the women who have always been in the kitchen cooking <laughs> not the men so exactly exactly <laughs> so there's like all these chronicles and legends and it's always yeah. like oh, and then this man came and then this man did this and it's like right. come on that these are the simplest ingredients women right. have spent centuries in kitchens do you really think you know a man invented dumplings i i just don't i just no. don't buy that no. 100% not. And I was, you know, it was interesting reading, you know, the influence of, of the Tatars, the Mongolians, and because, you know, my family's from Republic of Georgia, and we have Hinkali. And, you know, again, it's very similar, like, we're not sure where, you know, where they, who invented it, but, um, you know, very likely, they might have been remnants of Mongolian um, invasions and I thought it was interesting that they made it all the way to Poland and, and left their mark there as well. Um, Absolutely. And so actually, here's, here's a photo, yeah. a photo of the manti you have. Um, yes, which is so different to the Ukrainian manti, for example. Right. Aren't they? So it's really interesting because actually that's one thing I was kind of like uh, a little bit not sure about. I thought if I call it manti and people look at it and go, well, that's not manti. <laughs> it's kind of you know I was a little bit nervous about like oh should I use this name or should I uh, say you know the Polish chick and I was like no actually I'm just going to use it what people call it in those parts of oh, Poland yeah, and, yeah you know maybe they came from uh the Kinkali dumplings or maybe they came from uh, Momos or like who knows you know um well, well that's yes, the thing from the Tatar communities yeah well that's the thing with food is that you know it's something that travels and everyone everyone makes their own spin on it. And so it's, at, at some point it's like, who, it doesn't really matter who it belongs to, you know, because yeah. at some point it's, we all share it. And, and, you know, now that I have your recipes, I can put my own spin and they might look different and I might call them something differently, but it, at the heart of it, it's sort of the same. Absolutely. And what I really liked actually, 
is the kind of uh, the, the manti that you just showed, but um, kind of done in a really um, Polish way. So it's kind of like a mixture of the Tatar uh, cuisine and then with the Polish kind of very yeah. traditional kind of um, cuisine that you find, you know, uh, so many kind of farmer's cheese, sweet farmer's cheese, uh -huh. dumplings and uh, pancakes with a fruity sauce. Oh, the sweet, these ones, the sweet. But yeah, the sweet ones. Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, that for me is like the complete fusion of like, you know, the two kind of cultures in right. that place where they've lived for, you know, hundreds of years. So yeah. naturally the, you know, the different cultures will be fusing right. and then you have something like this. So I'm all for fusion, actually, you know, maybe not people that don't know what they're doing, but I think you have to experiment in the kitchen and you shouldn't get too caught up about, you know, how authentic is this? Because right. actually we have to develop and grow and fuse things together. And, you know, that's part of being human. Part of being human and also, you know, you mentioned diaspora cooking before before we started and, you know, people travel, people migrate and, and they have to adapt you know, their food to what's available to them. Um, and you talk a little bit about that too in the introduction of how you decided to structure the book. Um, you know, half of it is traditional and, and the second half is, is modern. And within the traditional, you have subsets of the different regions. Can you talk about, did you know going into the book that that's how you wanted to organize the book? Um, and can you talk a little bit about how it fell into place and how you chose to put which dumplings in which which region. Yeah, I mean, yeah, at times it was a little bit tricky, I have to say. And that's why we have a very big uh, festive section because <laughs> there are certain dumplings that, you know, we all eat. Um, they're not just the festive ones. For example, the summer bilberry pierogi or, you know, the ones with curd, sweet curd cheese. We'll, we'll eat them the whole country over, but I was finding that, um, you know, I guess what I'm really interested in from the traditional perspective is finding those traditions that are mm, at risk of dying out um, because they're perhaps traditional to one household or just a few households or, um, you know, they're not so popular that, you know, a recipe might just die with the person that's holding that recipe if someone else doesn't continue to cook it um and that's why it was really really um i was really happy to be able to preserve some of those little known recipes um like the kasha and uh tfarog ones for example that you mentioned mm -hmm. um because you know i actually traveled uh, around Lublin, these 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 pierogi are from Lublin. Uh, they came from my fr uh, friend who lives in Paris, and are. her grandma. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so they're actually sweet. So you can see the sugar there. So they're mm -hmm. sweet kasha and uh, tfarog. And all around Lublin, there's so many different um, kasha toasted buckwheat pierogi because that's the area where most of the uh, buckwheat is grown. So they are called gurachaki. Mm. Um, but where I had pies that were called gurachaki, I had plenty of pierogi, different shapes, different sizes that were called gurachaki, all stuff with kasha, and none of them contained tfarog and none of them were sweet. Mm -hmm. So this recipe is really quite unique and it's just so incredibly tasty I mean <laughs> anyone that has this you know my, my whole family has completely different tastes and anyone that tries this recipe is absolutely in love with it um so that's just such a gem and then some other recipes as well I found um again not traveling around Poland because I couldn't because of the pandemic but I reached out to my Instagram community and so many people of Polish heritage procured these sort of gold dust recipes for me from their aunt who doesn't have the internet. So sometimes we'd wait for weeks. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> these yeah, recipes yeah, were yeah. good. Some of them made it to me literally on the last day, you know, <laughs> when I'm handing the book in or something. And they're just so, so special. And while, you know, someone from the region might 
look at the book and say, well, I'm from the region and I've never tried that. That's kind of part of the point, because for me, it's just right. preserving that kind of culinary heritage that, you know, that might otherwise get lost. So part of the recipes from the different regions, because I have North, South, East, West and Central, were found sort of in, um, in old cookery books. But usually old cookery books just kind of have like the idea of a recipe and then you have to work on the recipe and work out how it's going to come together and work. Mm -hmm. um, some of them came, like I said, from my Instagram community um, or just by kind of word of mouth, you know, just reaching out to friends of my parents all over the country. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, funny, too, because, you know, you said you some of these recipes came from aunts or, you know, older generations. And, you know, as, as someone who, you know, grew up in an family and my mother and aunts, you know, I grew up around this food and I, you kind of take it for granted. You don't think twice that, okay, you know, when they're not around to, to make these dishes, like who will, I have to, I have to document them. Um, and sort of the, you pick up the task as almost like a food historian make sure that they're preserved and, and the culture is preserved through the recipes as well. Otherwise it dies out. Absolutely. So I think in my traditional part of the book, mm -hmm. I really had the role, uh, the role, as you say, of a food historian or a food anthropologist mm -hmm. where I'm not really changing the recipes unless someone, for example, gave me a recipe like I ate this in childhood. It looked like this. I remember she put this in there. And I would kind of have to make the recipe up, obviously, because there was no recipe. Um, but on the whole, I would try and preserve the recipe as close to the original um, as possible. Um, and then in the modern part of the book, it's kind of just me just experimenting within, I feel like, the the boundaries of authenticity. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not doing anything too outlandish, but I'm just kind of having fun with pierogi um, in many different ways. And also kind of catering to people that are vegan or gluten-free. And yeah, of course, about, pierogi, yeah. You, you talk about the, um, what was it? The, I forgot what, um, the magical buckwheat, the gluten-free, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it seems so. like they were a miraculous buckwheat and spinach pierogi. It seems like that must have been a journey. Oh gosh, the gluten free. I mean, I nearly canceled that whole chapter because <laughs> I mean, there are so many Polish dumplings that are naturally gluten free because right. they are a potato dough and yeah. they often contain potato flour and you can substitute that with corn flour or with corn starch, as you call it in America. Um, and yet, pierogi are just not <laughs> really meant to be gluten free. Yeah. And um, I found that really, really difficult. I experimented a lot and eventually I wanted something as well that I felt was kind of, um, that felt authentic to, you know, to Polish food. So that's why the buckwheat, I came back to the buckwheat in the end and I found a way which you could use it to make pierogi. But uh, I have to say, Oh, these are the dumplings, buckwheat dumplings. Yes, absolutely. So they're lovely. They're like little dumpling, dumpling version of blini. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the pierogi themselves, it's, it's a, you know, it's so, so gluten-free people can also use the book. However, I wouldn't say it's easy. It's not like you can just roll the flour right. out and be making pierogi for ages. You have to, I would do it in batches. You can't let the dough rest. You know, there's all these kind of disclaimers. Yeah. And there are people that actually have worked out how to make pierogi that are gluten-free themselves. And they add kind of um, various uh, ingredients right. to kind of make just uh, gluten-free flour manageable. Because if you just use gluten-free flour, it doesn't work. Right, yeah, gluten-free, um, I think cooking and yeah. baking is just a totally different yeah realm just yeah different. that's not my area of expertise yeah. but I really wanted something in there just to be inclusive yeah. yeah so can you talk a little bit more about what exactly makes up pierogi or you know talk about the dough um you know obviously there's so many different variations but kind of what comprises 
of like what comprises the traditional dough and kind of like the basic method of, of putting together. Yeah, the um, the most uh, basic original Polish method of um, making uh, pierogi was actually just flour, and you still see many. Uh, babushkas kind of making it like this these days and often don't even do it in a bowl it's just like a heap of flour yeah. and they get like a, either do it with their fingers or use a fork just get some oil into the flour like right on the just, table right yeah just yeah. like that and then pour hot water onto it and, uh -huh. <laughs> and literally that is it so yeah. that's why I'm just like come on I think we came up with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Because, yeah, it's just literally, that's the simplest dough. And people sometimes are so surprised. You know, when I'm making dough, often even Polish people, uh, recently I've had a kind of a few kind of TV interviews and both the presenters were like, I've never made a pierogi in my life, you know, a, a pierog in my life. So, you know, and they're kind of looking at it going, is that it? I mean, yeah. is it really that simple, you know? And I've had people ask me, oh, when do you put the yeast in? I'm like, well, I mean, <laughs> you don't have, I mean, that's a completely different, you can have pierogi with yeast in, but that's not the usual thing. Usually it's just literally flour and water, yeah. like a bit of oil, a bit of salt and, yeah. you know. And then uh, with the Italian influence, they say, oh. uh, the eggs came in. I was gonna uh, ask what the eggs do to the dough. And sometimes I've seen you've added melted butter as well. Yes, I have so many different doughs in this book. It's funny because in Polska, I had my favorite uh, dough recipe uh, that, you know, I was kind of like, this is my favorite recipe. And like everyone has yeah. got their own like <laughs> pierogi dough recipe. And the more I kind of delved into all these different pierogi doughs, like I, I've actually come to the point where I now don't have a favorite recipe anymore because it just depends on my mood, on the temperature of my hands, on whether I have eggs in the house, on who I'm cooking for, on the temperature outside sometimes, you know? Yeah. Because it's so dependent on so many different things. It's like the simplest thing in the world and you can really delve into all the like, <laughs> details of it and just be like well today it's this kind of weather so I'm going to make this kind of more flexible dough for example you know mm -hmm. um I really liked the dough with the eggs in it and the butter in it because it just tastes really rich and lovely and I find that after it's had a rest you can get it to be really lovely and flexible but actually even today I made the the simplest dough that you know I just described to you um and I'm always amazed at how incredible that one is as well you know actually okay. today it worked so well because I was experimenting with putting um leaves onto oh, uh -huh. it yeah uh, like some foraged leaves and uh and I was like gosh it just actually it's fantastic you don't you don't need anything else really so right. it's actually naturally vegan anyway mm -hmm. um but also, you know, depends on the flour you use and things like that. You can just use any flour like that's like, you know, as long as it's got gluten in, like it can be like the simplest, cheapest kind of flour. Or you can use the kind of more um, like pasta flour, which will make it. Yes, the result will be different, but it's it's not like a huge difference unless you're a pierogi connoisseur, you know, and I will use both flours again, depending on what I have in the house. Right. And it just, again, speaks to their versatility and adaptability and and why it's probably become this this iconic dish, because it's something that you can just riff on and not think twice about, not kill yourself over it. Absolutely. This is the thing. I think once people start making them, they'll just realize how easy and simple it is and how useful it is to have that in your repertoire because you can use up uh, use any leftovers up with just like the simplest kind of pierogi dough and also it's just a lovely tactile activity as well you know it's just a nice thing to be doing it's very therapeutic you know kneading the dough rolling it out when it's, you've got that lovely elasticity to it it's it's really really pleasant and what I did want to mention actually about the history of pierogi is that you know, it definitely started off as a peasant food. 
that's definitely um, something that um, we are sure of because um, Poland's first kind of um, official cookbook written in the beginning of the 17th century um, was written by a chef in a noble family. And in that book, there is no pierogi. There are, I think, two recipes, and this is a huge book, you know, hundreds of recipes, and there are two recipes for pierogi, mm. you know, which are, yes, a relative of pierogi, but it's like he's taken the peasant pierogi and, you know, stuffed them with roses and, <laughs> and things like that, you know. So to be fit for nobility. Yeah. Um, however, in time, everyone began loving pierogi. So yeah. <laughs> What's there not to love? And Rocks I think and butter and yes, I mean, and little like little pillows of love. Yeah. <laughs> and their versatility as well. You know their usefulness. I think in the peasant home they would have just just having that would have been priceless you know you make something one day and then you make something else out of your leftover ingredients and then whatever you have left you write you know you wrap up in dough and it's a completely different dish and I think this is why they've become so famous the world over as well because they're cheap they're easy and they're very very versatile it makes me think of hand pies um as kind of a food group because Every, almost every culture has its own version of hand pies and oh, hand pies, yes, hand yes. Pies. yes, and and they're so versatile. You use whatever you know ingredients are around. Absolutely. So I guess the uh, the traditional pierogi, yeah. um, you take that dough. Um, I always like to rest it. I've actually recently learned that some people don't even rest their dough, but I think it's important too because then you get that. Um, it's, it's just easier more to roll out. out. Exactly. Yeah. It's more pleasant to work with. Um, so once you're kind of cut and then you cut out either little circles or some people like to just kind of put the filling in, roll the dough over. I love yes. the section of the book. There we go. So these are the, the round pierogi. So you can get the round ones, which obviously have just twice as much filling as the usual kind of half moon shaped ones. Uh -huh. um that's me kind of covering yeah using that covering method there we go those are the little frilly edges my favorite method has to be the simplest one where you just cut out lots of circles and then you <laughs> my cutting no actually that's the method where I'm putting the filling on I'm folding it over and then I'm cutting it out yeah is there a method I'm not sure if there's lots of circles in there um, this one, you probably yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, that's got circles <laughs> there. That's my favorite just method. Just throwing up all sorts of photos. <laughs> yeah, I just really like that. Um, and it then, kind of reminds me of a hedgehog a little bit. Oh, yeah, those, that like, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you call it sunshine. I love that. I call it, I call it sunshine. Oh. Yeah, I really like those little pleated edges, especially for the modern ones. I think it's just quite a nice little modern way to finish them off. And this was the marbled... Was it was it beet? Uh, uh, rhubarb, 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 rhubarb. I use, but I use beet to actually color the dough. Uh -huh. so rhubarb inside, and I put it uh, on the side as well because I always like to have a little bit of extra fruit. Um, rhubarb and custard marble pierogi. Custard, yeah, That's those were amazing. real. Yeah, yeah, they people. I made them at um, at a supper club, and people really loved them. They ended up having seconds. So yeah, it was. Uh, there was such a big hit and uh, yeah I mean I like to use different uh, different colorings like natural colorings as well so I really experiment with that a lot myself and then the pinches I think people just do whatever they feel most comfortable doing again for me that changes on on the day with children for example because when I used to make pierogi with my grandma, I still remember this. Every time I would make a pierog, she'd take it and then she'd have to close it properly because little hands yeah. just can't quite press the dough right. yeah. enough. Um, so I've kind of devised ways where you don't have to keep doing that because that's like just essentially doubling up on the work. Right. Right. <laughs> it's a bit annoying for the children. Mm -hmm. You can't quite do it. 
Um, so you can use a fork just to go around the edges. That's a really good way of closing it. Um, or I kind of like to get my, my child to kind of close it and then I kind of fold over the edges mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. The frills, so right? Uh, there's, so there's frills as well. So the fork the ones. Fold over. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the fold over ones are here. So actually, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Were these all methods you knew going into the book or, or similar to kind of picking, you know, discovering new variations? Were there new types of, of crimping and folding that you discovered as you started writing? I knew all the ones that are in the book apart from one, which actually my photographer taught me. Uh -huh. And I call it the advanced one because it's actually quite tricky and not everyone can do it. You know, her mother can't do it. And actually my mum can't do it either when, you know, you just kind of, um, yeah, that's. I think, I think you posted about it on Instagram one and I was making. Yeah, I think, I think I'll probably show you. It's ready to put yeah. text <laughs> And I tried making it. I was like, this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to see someone doing it, you know? And then right. I kind of like did it. And then we went back to the shoot and all I was like, no, that's not quite it. <laughs> Yeah. Me again. So when we did a workshop together, all I was actually showing everyone how to do it. Mm -hmm. And once I've seen her doing it, I can do it. But sometimes, you know, you, you really just need to have that practice. And once you start yeah. doing it, it's so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's that level of kind of challenge to it. Yeah. It's become one of my favorite methods. <laughs> well, that's, you know, again, it speaks to the fact that you know a lot of it's just practice and and muscle memory and once you start doing it it just becomes you just don't think about it and that's yeah and eventually one day I hope to become one of those grandmothers who just yeah exactly <laughs> make them in there <laughs> can you talk a little bit um about you know we we I I brought this up um before we started but some of the uh, adjacent dumplings, the pierogi adjacent dumplings that you included, um, the pumpkin and so and yeah, the little hooves. I'm I'm, I'm blanking on on the Polish yeah. term. Yeah, we had the little hooves tonight actually. Um, so I really wanted the pierogi because they are the most famous dumpling, just to okay. kind of be an in. Uh -huh. So obviously we do have lots of lots of pierogi in there as well but I just wanted to uh, show all the different dumplings as well because I think there's some really wonderful dumplings in Poland and arguably the the other dumplings are kind of easier even than pierogi because they're, they're much quicker you know but make for example making a potato dough is just very quick mm -hmm. um and yeah some, you know some of these look like almost like the lazy dumplings almost look like um gnocchi Yes, yes, definitely. There's a there's a lot of similarities. And um, and I guess in different parts of Poland, they will use different sort of cheeses, for example, for the lazy mm -hmm. dumplings. So I think the one that you just showed was um, a sort of a, a mountain version. Yes. Using yeah. like brinza cheese, which uh -huh. is it's kind of like feta. So you can use feta instead, uh -huh. but makes it really tangy and salty. And brinza is typically Hungarian, right? Or... or um, Blanking. just in that it's just in the in south area yeah, in that whole area yeah, yeah okay. in the south of Poland Hungary mm -hmm. um I think they have something similar in Romania um and then we have things like pampuche which uh, are there we go so I uh, yeah so these ones are stuffed with caramelized onion um, but it's funny because, you know, they actually come from the area where my photographers come from. And she said, oh, we never stuffed them with anything. We just had them like that with our Sunday roast. So they would have them just simple. Probably steep. perfect for sopping up all the juices. Yes. And I was like, wow, that's wonderful, too. But she's like, but next time we're making the caramelized onion version, because that's like even nicer, you know, caramelized yeah. onion and the juices. Um, so they're kind of like the Polish bao buns. But they're a bit different because you'll, you know, you'll be eating them with like a, a Sunday roast, basically, traditionally. Yeah. You can just sort of have them as a snack as you well. Have these chocolate ones too, the chocolate plum pudding. Yeah, that's in the modern version. I was like, I couldn't resist making the chocolate ones with the plum yeah. butter because that's such a such a Polish taste, the chocolate and the plum. Um, 
And then let me have a let me have a look at some other ones. You have these deep fried. Oh yes, dumplings. Nigella's um, a favorite. Yes, actually. <laughs> They're one of the recipes that I knew I had to have in the book before I knew I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, my friend told me about this recipe such a long time ago, and she got it from her brother's girlfriend at the time, who made it uh, from her grandma's recipe. And then I completely had to kind of amend the recipe, it had like twice as many poppy seeds, and it was just, you know, very much to their kind of taste. Right. Um, and then I worked on it, and then when I was you know, when I was working on the book and then I sort of came back to her and well, by then, you know, they'd broken up and it, it wasn't, we hadn't, there wasn't any contact. So it kind of had a sort of complicated history. Where I was just like, okay, I'm just going to have to do this how I think it should be done. And, um, and then Nigella Lawson recently picked up on that recipe and talked about it as her kind of, you know, she featured it as her favorite yeah. one from the book. Um, so now I'm kind of just like, you know, I love this recipe because of that. But also it's it's got an interesting kind of um, history because um, it's from the region that actually my family came from. And my mum had never seen anything like it. And she was talking to her cousin about it. And her cousin, Anya, said that she remembers something like this being put in little bags on the Christmas tree. Oh. Yeah, so... There you go. It just sort of shows that actually the traditions can sort of change from one house to the next. Right. That's yeah. Really sweet, literally. Yeah, really sweet. And um, yeah. and I imagine it's like uh, because, you know, in the first Christmas trees used to contain things like walnuts and dried apples and things like that. And sweet things, actually. The first yeah. Polish Christmas trees anyway, you know, the really kind of. Yeah. Um, before the decorations came along. So I thought that's actually a really nice kind of thing to kind of carry over. And then, you know, you have a little bag on the Christmas tree and I guess you can pick them out. Yeah, and I need to start decorating my trees with fried dumplings. <laughs> that is just like right there, isn't it? level up. They're like little donuts, basically, you yeah. know. And you've got the poppy seeds, which obviously, even since pagan times, been, you know, about, you know, fertility and abundance oh. and, yeah. And, you know, speaking, speaking of the holidays, um, what are, you know, you said you have a whole festive um, set of dumplings. Yeah. What are, what are yeah. you know, we're going into that season. What are you? What Absolutely. You you make? Okay. So I think most families in Poland will be making the sauerkraut and wild mushroom pierogi. Mm. Um, they are just the most kind of typical, you know, traditional pierogi for the Christmas Eve feast. Um, because obviously uh, the Polish Christmas Eve feast is, um, well, not obviously, I guess, to some, but for, obviously for Polish people, it's uh, meat free. Yeah. So we have a lot of things like wild mushrooms, sauerkraut, beans, uh, beetroot, borscht, fish. Mm -hmm. um things like that um we will always also have um little ears stuffed with something like either mushrooms or in this book actually I've done a um a bean version with butter beans yes butter beans or fasola yash I think and a fermented uh, beetroot borscht that's always one of the starters um, and then I always like to make something that hasn't been traditional in my family, but it is traditional. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'll be inspired by some old cookbooks or something and make. So, for example, one Christmas, I made the dumplings that we just talked about, the the mm -hmm. fried, the little fried poppy seed ones. Um, I think Christmas before that, I made the um, the prune ones, which I found in my idol Hanna Szymanderska's book. I was going to ask about about her. Yeah, she was uh, she was a wonderful pioneer for Polish food. She wrote thirty five cookbooks in her lifetime, and sadly, she she died on her way to um the year I had my offer for my cookbook. Mm -hmm. Actually, first book, right? my first book, yeah, and uh, she died on her way back from a chicken soup festival, which you know it's kind of like 
so sad and yet sort of almost like she sort of went doing something that she really loved you know yeah. you can just tell that was her wasn't it you know mm -hmm. um that was her whole life and at first she was annoyed by the kind of communist governments you know it was very difficult to publish in communist times because you know the censors just you know made everything so difficult and changed everything so I guess by the end of it a lot of people are like that's not even my book you know <laughs> I mean it's silly it's actually silly because you know you know how can you censor you know cook recipes, cookbooks yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> but eventually she kind of broke through that and she just kind of you know uh, wrote one book after another and um and I met someone once that met her and he gave me the biggest compliment ever because um he said oh you know you really remind me of Han Nashamanderska not knowing that she was like my biggest idol <laughs> um and you know I, I was just so happy <laughs> and I talked to him about my love of her books and he said you know I've met her I used to work with her yeah. in tv and he sent me a book that she gave to him with a dedication personally. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. So now I send him my books. Well, in, in some ways you're kind of carrying, carrying the torch. Yeah, yeah. Abroad because Abroad. she was doing it within the country. So I guess, yeah, I feel like I'm continuing the work. Um, well, we are kind of getting towards the end and I wanna make sure we cover everyone's questions. Um, and someone asked, what are the most typical sauces um, for, for pierogi? Oh, okay. So um, I guess we don't have that many sauces as mm -hmm. such. What we have is okrasa. Okrasa are basically toppings. So the most popular toppings, I would say the most traditional toppings, are uh, like caramelized onion mm -hmm. or little bits of crispy bacon or both. Um, and then you kind of have variations on that. This is for the savory ones, of course, because you know, the sweet and savory are kind of two different uh, kettle of fish. So, um, so recently actually in a Polish restaurant um, that's just opened up a pierogi restaurant in Warsaw, um, they did kind of like a vegan take on the kind of caramelized and bacon, crispy yeah. bacon bits. And they did crispy celeriac, which was Ooh. really interesting, actually, yeah. and full of flavor. So anything kind of small, crispy, fried and fat mm -hmm. is a really good way to go. <laughs> and then uh, for the sweet ones, I would say you can't go wrong with soured cream, creme fraiche. If you don't have that yogurt. Um, you know, in the olden days, there used to be a little bit of sugar. I often pour a little bit of maple syrup or something like that to sweeten them a little bit more because I actually don't sweeten my dough at all. Some people do add a little bit of uh, sugar or something to their dough, but I just kind of go on the sweetness of the filling right. and then people can add a little bit more sweetness um, to the topping. I know I grew up um, eating bareniki, which, you know, is very, very similar. similar. That's so we just kind of like sweeten um, porog, the farmer's cheese, yes. and then topping it with sugar and some sour cream. And it's just so, just tastes like, it's like a taste of my childhood. Yeah. So, yeah, like, absolutely. So sometimes I even like, um, you know, have some bits of dough left over and I just um, boil them mm -hmm. and just have them with some soured cream and sugar. Oh. Maybe a bit of cinnamon sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling idea. crazy. <laughs> um, well, I'll keep asking while people think of more questions. Um, there's also, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the um, pierogi ruski, because I think it confuses yes. people. Yes. It's interesting because now pierogi ruski, and actually my first cookbook, I wrote I always thought they were Russian, you know, because yeah. that's what it sounds like. Right. Yeah. So obviously, you know, probably come from Russia. Uh -huh. um, it turns out that actually it's Ruthenian. Uh -huh. and so actually they come from the old Ukraine. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, and this is a, a but as well, because actually in the Ukraine, they don't eat them like that either. Now it turns out. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
because the pierogi ruske are tfarug, they're potatoes and caramelized onion. And that particular combination um, is actually, um, so they did come from the old Ukraine, but apparently they used to be called pierogi polskie in those areas um, before, um, you know, and then Poland, when Poland kind of uh, became, you know, a different country, they became Ruskia because they came from that area kind of thing. And that's so this, like southeast, correct? Or southeast, yeah. So they came from kind of like western parts of Ukraine, from what I understand. And they used to be called Pierogi Polskie. Now, then they were called Ruskia. Now, many places in Poland are calling them Ukrainian mm -hmm. because they're not Ruskia, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it makes them sound like they're from Russia and actually they're not from Russia. They're from the old Ukraine. And um, I think just also just in solidarity and also it's just more accurate as well about, you know, that's where they come from. So yeah, it's just, it's confusing and, and yes. Yeah, exactly. And actually, they're the most popular pierogi the world over. Right. I was going to say, I feel like when people think of pierogi, they think of this. Yes. These dumplings. Yes, these ones. And um, that's why I've done variations on pierogi ruske in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I might have called them Ukrainian if the... <laughs> if I'd known about what was going to happen, but mm -hmm. I wasn't I was writing the book before that. Um, so basically I've got a French version that someone from France sent me with French cheeses in there. Mm -hmm. I've got the version of the old Polonia here in the UK, which uses cheddar. Mm. And, um, and then I've got the kind of a Polish version that a lot of people are having in Poland now, which my friend suggested to me with, um, with the twarog that's smoked. So that gives it a different flavor as well. Ask, I don't think I've seen that here in the U.S. That must be. Oh, that's a shame because we're finding it in Polish shops. Yeah, there is um, there's a cheese that's um, it's smoked smoked fresh goat's cheese, but that's oh, a little okay. bit different. You know, I bet you could, I bet you could um put that in there, yeah, because they're so yeah. versatile, and I think this is why they're so popular the world over, because. All these versions, okay, they're not authentic, but they're all delicious, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> they taste different, but it's like a wonderful way of kind of um, letting pierogi live in various guises. Mm -hmm. um, and there's someone that's, that asks, what is faruk? And maybe, maybe they, um, maybe they're hearing it incorrectly. I think it's tworog. Um, I'm saying tfarog because in, in Polish tfarog. it's tfarog. tfarog. Yeah, yeah. I think in different we all pronounce it yeah. slightly differently. I, yeah, I say tfarog, but that's it's just yeah, it's all the same. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about maybe for those who are unfamiliar with? Absolutely. Um, so tfarog is just kind of the most common cheese in that part of the world that. Actually, my grandma used to make herself, and I think many people remember their grandmas. As long as you have raw milk from a cow, then you can use a muslin and just uh, let it, you let it go sour. You know, you let it ferment, and then um, and then you end up with this really fresh cheese that we use both for sweet and savory dishes. And I think it's the equivalent of farmer's cheese in the U.S. Yes. I mean, I can't be sure. I think, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how how it is in the US. I mean, do farmers make it themselves or is it just something you get in the shop and it's called Farog's uh, Farmer's it's, Cheese? I think um, what you know as Farog, um, you can usually get it in the Eastern European markets here. Okay, yeah. Um, and they sell them also in grocery stores here, but the consistency is a little bit different. Yeah. It's not quite... Yeah, even from one make to the next. I mean, you have yeah. to kind of find your favorite kind of yeah. brand. Some are more dried and 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 kind of crumbly, yeah. and some are more kind of paste-like, yeah. similar to ricotta. There's there's a yes. variety. And actually, having said that, if you get one that's very crumbly, uh -huh. you could add a little bit of kefir to it or something like uh -huh. that. 
to make it a little bit more creamy because right. you have to always mash it and you don't want a crumbly consistency it'll be make, difficult to make pierogi so you need to make get it quite creamy and kefir is always a good place to start or or just a bit of soured cream or something like that mm-hmm. uh yeah it says i believe the spelling in the book is tuarog uh with a w oh yeah that's just because in poland um yeah. the the w is a v okay yeah <laughs> yeah um well I can keep asking you more and more questions you said what kind you said that you made um pierogi this morning what kind what kind were they oh yes um I was experimenting with um kind of foraged uh oh right things so wild foods and things so I was using like a little bit of hawthorn mm. and just some herbs and oh, and the tfarog that we talk about yeah. <laughs> So you have one, you have a recipe for that with parsley leaves. Yes. I mean, you can use the tfarog in so many different ways. And right yeah, beautiful. there we go. There we go. So actually, uh, yeah. And we've got a, uh, yeah, tarragon parsley. So the herby ones, I think tfarog works really, really well with all kinds of herbs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in this, all the sweet ones, really like the, um, the creative section, a lot of them are based on tfarog as well, on the sweet, um, yeah, on the sweet tfarog, basically. And then, you know, to some of them, I might add a little bit of orange, for example, like the chocolate. Um, yeah. yeah, gosh, sorry, it's difficult for me to find these ones. The chocolate ones, for example, the marbled chocolate ones. The filling is tfarog, but then it tastes very kind of... Um, orangey because it just that flavor uh-huh. just works really well with chocolate so you'll kind of use orange peel and stuff like that um and in another one I might use raisins so I would say that tfarog is always a really really good base um and then I just noticed some sesame seed toppings actually seeds can make really good toppings as well that's not traditional but that's just something that can work really well there we go, the sweet potatoes one, ones with sesame seeds. And you really can't go wrong with frying your pierogi in butter. So yes, yeah, I guess like the most basic ones are just boiled in salty water and that's delicious in itself. But my favorite ones personally are always just like crispy fried in butter until golden on both sides. And um, yeah, it just gives it that extra kind of... Uh, Oh my gosh, that Moorish, <laughs> you know. Oh, hello, it's, Zoe. It's, it's the food that hello. keeps on giving because you could do it with your leftovers. So, absolutely. And also, it's worth making a lot. So, you can have some boiled and then the next day you can, you know, just fry them up. Magic of pierogi. <laughs> oh my gosh, everything sounds so delicious. There are so many recipes you mentioned that I can't wait to try. And as, um, Paulina mentioned, um, I guess on Instagram, this colder weather that we're having is definitely the time of year. It makes me want to just eat all the pierogi. So I'm very excited. <laughs> I know I have to remind myself next time to eat to eat lunch before before I start I the author talk because now I'm so hungry. And I know. Eat exactly. All of the pierogi. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Susa, congratulations. It's such a fantastic book. We're very excited to cook from it. And thank you, everyone that tuned in today as well. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's so wonderful that we can do this across so many. Absolutely. Oh, well. such a treat. Thank and you Paulina, so thank much. you. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you so yeah. much. It's lovely to meet so you. Fun. Thank thanks, you, Susa. Have thank a great you. day. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.